song in your head. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. Our text today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. And if you would, would you please stand so that we can show honor to the Word of God today? We're going to read verses 26 through 28 or 29. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Today the title of the sermon shall be, God Can Use Anyone. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I am so thankful so, for for the beauty of this text. Lord, I thank you that you are willing to use anyone. At times, even as we see in the Old Testament, even using a donkey to proclaim the word of God. And that ought to give us great hope uh, that you can use us as well. Lord, I pray today that you would help your word of God to be powerful in our hearts and minds. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide us to be willing to be used of you. Pray that you would bless our pastor today, Pastor Paul Grants, as he preaches. We pray all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. Please be seated. As Pastor Paul comes forward, I just want to uh, say real quickly that uh, Pastor Paul has been a tremendous blessing to me. Before uh, our church had a, before this church had a pastor, I used to come when I was in the legislature and on weekends where I was snowed out of Thermopolis. I would come to Pastor Paul's Sunday school class, and uh, I just fell in love with him. Uh, just a man of God preaching the Word of God very faithfully. And while I didn't know many people in the church here yet, I came to know uh, Pastor Paul and uh, Pastor uh, or, or John uh, Graber as well. And uh, I just I was so thankful for the opportunity. I got your phone number from someone I won't say who, and I shared your phone number with a pastor in Laramie. Uh, Pastor Paul Martin. So I got Paul and Paul together. And what happened is God then brought Pastor Carl here to this church. And God has done a miraculous thing. Pastor Paul, thank you so much for your faithfulness to the Word of God and to ministering in this church. We're so glad that God is going to use you today to preach His Word. Thank you so much. Thanks, brother. Just remember as we talk about this that it was... Pastor Nathan equated you to a donkey, so. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but anyway. You know, I can't help but think about, I've, uh, we've taken two special offerings for the children's ministry, for the children's area downstairs, and Pastor Carl's asked me to preach both times. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, if anything, but... But seriously, go downstairs. I mean, as uh, knowing what it's looked like downstairs for a long time, it's really cool to see. They're doing a great job, and it's going to really be uh, a very important and very useful uh, space for us to show love to our kids and, and minister the Word of God to them. So if you get a chance, please go down and look. It's awesome. Um, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul, <clears throat> Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, we can see the establishment of the, of the Corinthian church in Acts chapter 18, the first 18 verses. Uh, Paul went there from Athens. Corinth is, is in, in Ismuth is between mainland Greek and the peninsula of Pel uh, Peloponnesia. And um, it's about, Corinth is about 45, 50 miles west of Athens. So Paul went there. Um, and he ended up being there for a year and a half. Corinth was a very prosperous city, but it was morally bankrupt. Uh, they, they had people coming from everywhere. They had merchants, sailors, they had Greeks, they had Jews, uh, they had Italians. Everybody would come there, sailors. Everybody showed up at Corinth. They had two working uh, ports that were very important and helped Corinth be, to be very prosperous. Um, but they were very pagan. They had belief systems from everywhere. They had a, 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 what it was a beautiful temple. 
uh, to Aphrodite. They had a thousand priestesses there, which were nothing more than temple prostitutes. But they, but they said you could see this temple from miles. It was up on a hill. So out at sea, you could see this from a long way away. Uh, one, one commentator said about Corinth, it was intellectually alert, materially prosperous, but morally corrupt. J. Vernon McGee said, the vices from the east and the west met at Corinth and joined hands. So I mean, everything, anything and everything went in Corinth. They used to have a phrase to, to, to act the Corinthian. And if they said that about you, you were, you were uh, negotiating in moral depravity. I mean, you were, you were in the depths of sin. So that was a, a way they talked about it. But we see that Paul's writing to the church here, and that was the backdrop for Paul's ministry there. Um, in, in Acts chapter 18, he gets there um, after having disputed with the Jews, as he always did, and of course they rejected him. Um, the Bible tells us that he went to stay with a man and stayed with a man named Justice, and his house was right next door to the synagogue. And the chief uh, of the synagogue was named Crispus. And the Bible says that Crispus and his whole family got saved. So obviously Paul hit him up. And it said many Corinthians were saved and they were all baptized. Um, but Paul, we see in this letter, uh, well, it, well, I'll get to that part, but as, as you can see in the, in the letter, the first nine verses is Paul's salutation. You can tell he loves these Corinthians. He cares about them. Um, but we, we know from the Word of God that it's not... So he, he wasn't the first person to love the Corinthians. In, in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city." Folks, God loved the Corinthians before Paul ever did. And the Bible, and, 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 and I, when I was reading up on it, they said there were as many as 400,000 people in the city of Corinth. So Paul went there, and he was rejected by the Jews, and he says, okay, I'm going to the Gentiles. Well, he goes, and, but Crispus is the leader of the synagogue. He gets saved, his family gets saved, they all get baptized. And, but, but yet God tells him right after that, he said that to him. He said, don't be afraid. So that tells me that Paul was afraid. Because, as usual, he went to the Jews, the Jews rejected him, and then they came after him. And that's exactly what they did in, in chapter 18. They brought him before the, the magistrate, Galileo, and he rejected their, their premise. They were trying to, they came on him in one accord, the Jews did, and tried to get Paul in trouble, tried to get him in jail or killed. And he said, I don't want to hear it. But the whole reason I say all this in, in regards to 1 Corinthians 1 is in verse 1, Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God in Sosthenes, our brother. Well, when, when, when the, the magistrate rejected their, their attacks on Paul and said, get out of my sight, they went back to the synagogue and they pulled the leader of the synagogue out and beat him. Now, this wasn't Christmas because Christmas either quit or got booted after he got saved, but the new leader of the synagogue was Sosthenes. So, but Paul here in verse 1 says, he's our brother. So Paul must have gotten to him too through the word of the Lord because Sosthenes is here. Paul gives his name as a reminder to the Corinthians of somebody that they would know. It was, it was a familiar name. And some commentators even think that, because Paul wrote this letter, it wasn't the first letter he wrote to the Corinthians, but the first one recorded in the Bible, but Paul wrote this letter in reaction to some questions that the Corinthians asked him. Some think that Sosthenes took that letter to Paul and said, here, here are questions. And he may have even been Paul's scribe for this letter because Paul says at the end, I'm write, writing part of this with my own hand. And he may have been the one that took this letter back to them. So anyway, Paul just gave him a, a, a familiar face. Um, but anyway... Starting in verse 19, we'll skip ahead a little bit. In verse number 19, the, uh, Paul begins to talk about the wisdom of God. Um, and in verse number 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing 
the understanding of the prudent. He's quoting Isaiah 29, 14, and, he's, and, and, and Paul begins to compare the wisdom of God with the wisdom of men. Um, we see in, 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 in verses 20 and 21, uh, Paul says, where is the wise? Where are the prudent? In regards to Isaiah 20, 29, 14, God says, I'm going to make these guys look stupid. And, and, the, and so the Bible says here, where is the wise? Um, where is the prudent? Um, I, I will de- destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? In God's wisdom, the world through human wisdom did not know him. As a matter of fact, Paul says the natural man can't know him because the things that of God are spiritually discerned and they can't do that. But God was pleased to use the foolishness of preaching in verse 21. And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that were believed. God wanted to use what the world sees as the foolishness of preaching to save people. You know, Romans 10, 14 tells us, How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to tell them. And God has, has used the foolishness, so-called, of preaching to save those that were lost. And, and, and I'm thankful for that. God wants us to be that mouthpiece. The wisdom of God offends human wisdom. They don't get it. They don't understand it. The pursuit of human wisdom will never provide the true knowledge of God. It can't happen. And we'll look at a couple examples later. But but man's wisdom will never understand it. In verses 22 and 23, Paul's using these verses from 19 on to to build up to where he relates God's wisdom to the Corinthian people. But he says in verses 22 and 23, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. People can't handle the preaching of the cross today, and we see that they couldn't handle it then either. They weren't able to take it. And why? Why was it a stumbling block to the Jews, and why was it foolishness to the Greeks? Well, it, it tells us there in verse number 23 that we preach Christ crucified. Now, that's an oxymoron to the Jews. Christ means Messiah, and, what, and, and Messiah stood for power, for splendor, for triumph. Their Messiah was going to come in and take over and free them. It, the Messiah was, was power and authority to them. But yet the cross, crucified, it it stood for weakness, for defeat, for humiliation. That message was hard to the Jews. They didn't get it. It was an oxymoron. How could the all-powerful Messiah die such a horrible death on the cross? It didn't make sense to them. And of course, the Greeks said, well, that's stupid. (laughs) You're going to trust in one to save you that died on a cross? That didn't make sense. The Roman statesman Cicero said, The cross, it speaks of that which is so shameful, so horrible, it should never be mentioned in polite society. It was such a horrible thing, it shouldn't have even been mentioned, but yet the Messiah died on the cross. It was a stumbling block to the Jews. They didn't understand it. It just just ground their gears. And that's why, because if you go read in, in Acts 18, the Bible says Paul went to the Jews and he preached to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Bad news. Jews don't like that. They hated it. Why? Because of this. It was a stumbling block to them. They didn't understand it. They didn't get it. But praise God, some did. In verse 24, it says, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. But to them that are called both Jews and Greeks. Paul makes a point to include the Gentiles 
with the Jews, that was the mystery of the gospel. That the, the Paul, uh, Paul told the, the Galatians that the mystery, he told the Ephesians, the mystery was that the Jews were going to be fellow heirs of the truth along with the Jews. Everybody's even, on even ground at the cross. Galatians 3.27 and Colossians 1.11 tells us there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. We are all one and the same at, at, at the cross. And some took that. Some believed that they did. And it says there in verse 24, it says that to them which are called. Well, back in verse number 2, when Paul uh, announced who he was writing this to, he said, uh, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Paul said, you've been called to be saints. You have been called by God to be saved. That's why God told Paul in Acts 18, I got a lot of people here. Uh, they need the gospel, and you're going to give it to them. But don't be afraid. Trust me, right after I tell you this, the Jews are coming for you, but nobody is going to touch you. Be why? Because I've got a lot of people here. I want these people saved, and I'm going to use you, use you to tell them. But in verse 25, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Even the quote-unquote foolishness of God is better than men. It, even even uh, God's wisdom, the power of God, it's the wisdom of God. Even if you classified anything God did as foolish, it was still better than man's. Proving that the, that the foolishness and weakness of God, quote-unquote, is wiser and stronger than men. God's wisdom is not man's wisdom raised exponentially. It is wisdom of a different order. God said through Isaiah in Isaiah 58, uh, 55, verses 8 and 9, He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God says, I think on a different plane than you. And why is that? Because God is transcendent. God is above. He's, he's greater than, than His creation. He rises above it. The Bible tells us in, in, in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God says, there's nobody like me. There's nobody like me. Why? He says, because I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which are not yet done. God can see the end from the beginning. You know why John wrote Revelation? You know how he could write it, right? God brought him up and said, here, come up and see this, son. I want you to watch this. I want you to hear this. I want you to write it down. Well, John watched everything of the end times that we talk about. He watched it all happen. How could that be? Because God sees it right now. God could see it. He said, John, I want you to see what I see. And when John looked and saw everything happening in Revelation, God showed him that. At the same time, God looked back and watched the flood. God can see it all. He sees it all at the same time. He says, I am that I am, because he's not I was or I will. God is always in the present tense. He's always transcended. He knows everything. That's why you could say in Deuteronomy 18, he said, if, somebody, if a prophet comes and, and purports to say something in my name, you know how you can tell if he's 100% right. If he's not, kill him. Because he's not speaking for me. Why? Because God says, because I know it all. I got it. And if this guy isn't right, rest assured, he's not for me. So even God's in, in his foolishness is wiser than men. Now in verse 26, Paul looks at the, at the Corinthians, he says, For ye see in your calling, brethren. He says, well, let's look at you as an example of, for what, of, how, of how God's wisdom works. He says, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many mobile, uh, uh, noble are called. Paul told them that they could see through their own calling, back to verse number 2 again, that in the world's eyes, not many were wise, mighty, or noble. The world looks at the Christian and goes, man, are you guys dumb? You, 
You, uh, haven't you heard people say, oh, well, the, you people are mentally weak. You just use this as a crutch because you're so weak. My answer to that is, you betcha. You betcha we do. I'll admit that. I need my Savior. I need Him. I will take that. But these people spout their, spout their, their, their stuff, and they say, well, you guys are stupid. And, and Paul says, you can see it right in your, own, in, in your own example. Not many of you were wise according to the world. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble. But, praise God for verse 27, the first word is but. Paul basically says, that's all right. God likes doing that. God likes to use them. In verse 27, he says, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. The Bible tells us, tells us that God likes to use what the world deems as foolish. The Greek word there is moros. Want to take a shot at what English word we get from that? Yeah, moron or moronic. God likes to use those that, that the world thinks, oh man, this guy's a moron. Are you kidding? God likes to use the weak things. It means sick, feeble, impotent. He likes to use base things, those of, of low degree, ignoble, cowardly, of no family, low-born, from the other side of the tracks. He likes to use those. The things which are despised, he likes to use those. Of no account, utterly despised. And then the things which are not, counted or viewed as nothing, to, to what? To bring to naught the things that are. The things that are counted as wise, as good. So God uses nobodies, to bring to nothing the somebodies. That's what Paul's telling them here. Hudson Taylor said, God uses men who are weak and feeble enough to lean on him. And that's what God wants. And we're going to see why God does it that way. But Paul, some think that many of the Corinthian believers were of low estate. They were either former or current slaves which can be said of the overall expansion of the church. Throughout history, the church has been known as, as the, the weak overcoming the strong, the feeble overcoming the powerful. It's, it's, that's because God did it that way. He does it that way now on purpose. Followers of Christ described in this way lent credence as to why so many thought that this was foolish, foolishness. Back in verse number 18, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. So many people thought this was foolish, and one reason they had for it was all the people that God were using. God would use people that the world would say, they're no account. They are, they are not usable. They're not useful. But others felt that God's methods shown here were to beat down the pride and vanity of men. The Corinthians had an issue with spiritual pride. Paul addresses it in chapter 4. You can go read it. But even earlier in chapter 1, back in verses 10 through 17, Paul says that, that you know, the, I want you to be of one mind. I want, you to be, uh, I want there to be no divisions. I want you to be perfectly joined together in the same mind. He wants unity. But he said, the house of Chloe told me that there isn't. And because of those contentions, those divisions, the, the Bible says that, that some of these people in this church were saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. And for the really spiritual ones, they said, I'm of Christ. And Paul tells them in verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, this is stupid. It, this is wrong. And this is so wrong. And it, they, it caused so much contention that this is what Paul said to them in chapter 3. Now remember, Paul loved these people. But we talked about in Sunday school today, 
that you speak the truth in love. You tell people the truth. You don't compromise truth for love. And Paul chastises these people. He reprimands them in this book, but it's because he loves them. And this is what he said to them about this very division of people who say, well, I, I'm a follower of Paul. Well, I'm a follower of Apollos. Well, I'm a follower of Christ. And this is what Paul says about that in chapter 3, verse number 1, starting in there. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but, uh, but, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envyings and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulos, are ye not carnal? He says, aren't, you're acting like babies. And how do I know that? Because you have these contentions. You're taking sides. He says, Christ isn't divided. We're all together in Christ. And he says, because of this, you're acting like a baby. And I can't talk to you. I can't give you spiritual things because you can't take it. You're, walk, you're carnally minded. And Romans chapter 8, verses 4 through 8 tells us, that those who walk in the flesh and those who are carnally minded are enmity against God. They're the enemies of God. And it says they cannot please God. So when, when, when the Corinthians are acting this way, Paul is saying, I have to treat you like a baby because you know no better. Carnal means pertaining to the flesh, governed by mere human nature and animal appetites. But the Bible tells us throughout the Word of God, that God loves doing this. The Bible says it pleases God to use these kind of people. And we see it throughout the Scripture. I mean, we know Abraham. He was 75 years old before God even called him. And his family were, was, were pagan. Abraham was 80 years old when God called him from the burning bush. And what was, what was Moses' response? I can't speak. I just, I'm just not a very good talker. You know, Jeremiah used the exact same excuse in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah used the same thing. Gideon. Wasn't much to Gideon. I'm in the smallest tribe. Our family's really poor, and I'm the youngest in the family. Not much going for Gideon. David. David was the youngest boy of eight. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, in verse 1, God says, I want you to go to the house of Jesse because I've picked the next king from these guys. So Jesse goes there, he calls him to a sacrifice. Jesse and all his boys show up, and, and, and he, 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 he walks Eliab through, through there first, and Samuel goes, oh, wow. He's cool. He's got to be the one. And God basically said, come on, Samuel, didn't you learn anything from Saul? He says, nope, that's not him. And he paraded the rest of the boys in front of Samuel and Samuel, and Samuel goes, nope, 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 nope. And he gets to the end, and he looks at Jesse and goes, you got anybody else? You got any more boys? Jesse's response, he says, oh yeah, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. He didn't even name David by name. He says, ah, oh, the youngest is out there playing around with the sheep. He didn't give David's name to Samuel, and he didn't even invite his youngest son to the sacrifice. Huh. The demoniac of the Gadarenes. I, this is one of my most favorite. I love this guy. I call him Fred. I, the demoniac of the Gadarenes is awful, awful big, uh, loud mouth. A lot of words. I just call him Fred. But in Mark, in Mark chapter 5, we know the story. Jesus is in the boat with, with, his, with his disciples. Storm comes up. Jesus wakes up, calms the sea. They get to the other side. They step off the boat, and they hit Fred. And Fred is running around in the tombs, naked, howling at the moon like a wolf or a coyote. They try and chain him up. They can't. This guy breaks the chains, and they, these people are terrified of him. Well, Jesus heals him. And, the, and Legion says, hey, if you're going to throw us out, let us at least go to the pigs. 
And, you know, about 2,000 pigs run off the cliff. You know the story. And, and all the people, all the guys keeping the sheep said, uh-oh. They ran into town and told everybody. And everybody came out to see what was going on. And the Bible says when they, what, they looked at the guy, they looked at Fred, he was in his right mind. He had his clothes on. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says that scared them. They were afraid. Whoa, what happened? So what they do? They looked at Jesus and said, please go. We don't get it. Get out of here. So now we're talking about the one who said, for I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I have come. I am the resurrection and the life. And they said, Jesus, you've got to go. And what's his answer? Okay. He turns around and gets back in the boat. But Fred wants to go with him. And, and Jesus looks at Fred and says, Nope, I don't want you to do that. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. He said, Nope, Fred, I want you to go tell everybody. Fred was uniquely qualified to give the message of the gospel and Jesus said, go use it. Now, can you imagine Fred's testimony? The Bible says in verse 20, he went all through the Decapolis, all ten towns, telling what Jesus did. Hmm, Lord and Jesus, yep, they're equal. He told them everything. Can you imagine him coming up and people going, wait a minute. Weren't you the guy in the tombs running around naked, howling at the moon? He goes, yeah, look. He shows them before and after picture. And they go, look at this, and now look at this. Folks, he was uniquely qualified to give the message of what the Lord had done for him better than anybody else. The apostles. We think of the apostles. Great men of God. You look in Revelation 21, when the, when, when the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven, it has 12 foundations, and in those foundations are written the apostles of the Lamb. These were the foundation of the church. Well, four of them, possibly as many as seven, were fishermen. One was a zealot, one was a tax collector, and one was a traitor who betrayed his Lord. That's not, a, that's not uh, anything to write home about. That's not a lot of great credentials there. So much so that when Peter and John, when they preached their second message in, in, in Acts chapter 4, when 5,000 people got saved, they put them in jail. The next day they brought them before the rulers. And we know what Peter said to them. He says in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But you know what the next verse says? It says that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, oh, I want, to, I want to make sure I get this right, and they realized that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Huh. These guys preaching and, and speaking of, the, of their Savior with such boldness, but the, but the rulers, the very ones that crucified Christ, looked at these guys and said, you're unlearned and ignorant. They marveled. They said, where's this coming from? But it says they also took notice that they'd been with Jesus. There's the qualifier. There's the qualifier. They were with Christ. These unlearned and ignorant men went, went, went wild for Christ. They preached the gospel. They, these, these leaders marveled at these guys. These guys were fishermen. They knew nothing. But yet Christ used them in a mighty way. Another story, I like this one. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who not only prayed for the hyper-teenage boys in his class, but also sought to win each one to the Lord personally. One young man in particular didn't seem to understand what the gospel was, so Kimball went to the shoe store where he was stocking shelves. He didn't attend the school past fifth grade. He couldn't spell, and his grammar was awful. He talked with him in the stock room about the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. On that Saturday, he believed the gospel and received Jesus Christ as Savior. Kimball said of this young man, I can truly say, and in saying it, I magnify the infinite grace of God 
he has bestowed upon him, that I have seen few persons whose mind were spiritually darker than was his when he came to my Sunday school class. And I think that the committee of the Mount Vernon Church seldom met an applicant for membership more unlikely ever to become a Christian of clear and decided views of the gospel truth, still less to fill any extended sphere of public usefulness. That's what Edward Kimball said about this young man that he led to Christ. This guy is nothing. I've never met one that had a darker outlook, that had a darker past. He can't read, he can't spell, he can't write. His, his grammar is horrible. It says here, in fact, the first time he tried to join the church, he was refused. When asked what Christ had done for him, the nervous young man replied that he wasn't aware of anything particular. So he went for membership, and the, and the guy goes, okay, well, what, what, what has Christ done for you? And he goes, eh, nothing I can think of. Leaders felt that this was un, an, an unacceptable answer. Well, I could see that. This young man was, was Dwight Lyman Moody. D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody. It was said of him that he could pronounce Jerusalem in two syllables. Try that sometime. I've tried. It's kind of hard. Yet in his lifetime, he shook two continents for God with thousands professing Christ through his ministry. They say you can count the apples on a tree, but who can count the apples in a seed? I'm sure Kimball had no idea how many apples were going to come from the seed planted in Moody. Okay, well, this, this letter was written to the Corinthian church. That was the immediate context of this letter. But the broader context is to us. We're part of the church too. We're, we're a local New Testament church just like the church in Corinth. So what do we do? We've been called. I've, I've been watching. I think everybody in this room is alive. There's something for us to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be alive. What are we supposed to do? Well, in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, we find one of the most beloved verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We understand that. We understand that. But what are we supposed to do with that? That passage doesn't stop there. Verse number 18 says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now you might have said when you got saved, mm, what should I do? You think I should get in the ministry? Maybe I should go to school? Well, let me break this to you. When you get saved, you're in the ministry. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to get paid by a church. Paul says right here, he's given us. He included himself. He's talking to the church. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And the Bible says there in verse 18 that God did it through His Son. Folks, on that day in Calvary, uh, on Calvary, what we're going to celebrate here in just a few minutes, there was a transaction made. There were two warring parties on that hill that day. On one side, we have God the Father, a holy, just God that demands a payment for sin. And Leviticus 17, 11 tells us that that payment's got to be blood. On this side of the table, we've got mankind, born in sin, by nature, children of wrath. And not only that, they're shaking their fist at God saying, nope, they needed a mediator. In stepped the grand arbitrator of mankind, our Lord Jesus Christ. He was on that cross. He was the only one uniquely qualified to bring the two warring parties together. The Bible says he was the Son of God. John 5 tells us that, when, that, that they, know, they knew that when he said that, when God was his Father, he was making himself equal with God. He sure did. I and my Father are one. So he represented, on this side of the table, he represented heaven. He was God. On this side of the table, he called himself the Son of Man all the time. I heard a guy just say yesterday, 76 times in the, in the Gospels. I haven't counted them, so I don't know. But Jesus loved that term for himself. Why? Well, of course, that points back to Daniel 7, 13, 
But every time Jesus said, I'm the Son of Man, He's the one coming to the Ancient of Days to receive the kingdom. But He also said it because He was man. Son of Man means He's equal with man. So Jesus could reach on this side of the table and grab mankind. He could reach on this side of the table and grab, grab sides together and reconcile them. He was the only one that could do it. The word reconcile means to restore a relationship that, that was broken but now produces wholeness. Not only that, but in verse 19 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has given unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay, so now we've got the ministry. God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us the word of reconciliation. He's given us the gospel to be, to be sure to include not imputing your trespasses to them. If you want to know what imputing means, just draw an arrow from verse 19 to 21. That's imputation. But he said, he said, it's given unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay, we've got the ministry, we've got the word. What do we do with it? Verse number 20. Now then, some of your versions may have therefore. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Folks, God says, I did the work through my son. I did it at the cross. I, the payment was made for sin. But now I want you all to go tell them. I want you to tell them. You're my ambassadors. What are we to do after we get saved? We are supposed to be ambassadors. And the Bible says there in verse number 20, it's just as though God was begging you Himself. We pray you in Christ's stead. We urge you. We plead with you in Christ's stead, in the place of our Savior. Why? Jesus is back in the throne, up in heaven. But now, God is using us. He told the Corinthians, I'm using you guys to tell them. I want you to beg them to be reconciled to God. You're my mouthpiece. You're speaking for me. You're my ambassador. An ambassador is a representative of one sovereign that goes to another sovereign to represent his sovereign. We are citizens of heaven. He leaves us here. We're alive today to be the representative of our sovereign to this world. That's what we're supposed to do. Why would God do such a thing? Well, we saw in verses 27 and 28, he's going to confound everybody. That word confound means to put him to shame or disgrace them. But verse number 29 says that no flesh should glory in his presence. There is never going to be one human being that's going to stand before God and say, man, was I cool. I can't believe, Lord, I used my intellect, I used my expertise. Boy, you sure are. You should be glad I was working for you. You know, Adrian Rogers used to say that people like that would say that they were doing God a wild favor to go to church or to serve him. No. God says, uh-uh. I want everybody to know who's doing the doing. I, I, I made mention of Gideon before. You know the story of Gideon. The Midianites came. Verse 12 of, of Judges 7 said there was a boatload of Midians and Amalekites. They were all there. Gideon got 32,000 guys. In verse number 1, and what does God say in, in Judges chapter 7, verse number 2? And God said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt or glorify themselves against me, saying, mine own hand hath done it. God says, you've got too many, because if you win with this number of people, you're going to say, wow, man, were we, were, were we tacticians or what? Man, we are... We are prime fighters. That Gideon's a great general. God says, nope, you got too many. And through a series of two events, God whittles it down to 300. And what does God say then? He says um, in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, in verse number 9, says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that have lapped, 
will I save you and deliver the Midianites into my hand? God says, okay, you got 300. Perfect. Now, I'm going to save you. And everybody is going to know Gideon couldn't possibly be that good of a general to go up against the, uh, the, the multitude. The Bible says in verse 12 that they were like grasshoppers. He said, no way. No, everybody's going to know that I did it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I, was just, I just read from there. But in verses 6 and 7, Paul says, I have planted, this is watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he that planteth is he anything, neither he that watereth, but God gives the increase. Paul says, the guy that plants and the guy that waters is as nothing. It's God that gives the increase. So God uses, uses weak feeble people like us to accomplish his plan in the church so that everybody will know that God did it. Nobody will ever be able to boast. Regardless of our background, God has given us all unique experiences and gifts to build up the church and glorify him. It's one of the things we get to do when, when new people come into the church. We get a chance to read their testimonies. I tell you, that is, so, that is so much fun. It's such a blessing because you see people starting here, starting there, starting over here. Their path winds around this way. This one winds around this way. They all have unique paths. They all have unique experience, but every single path ends up at the same place, the cross. But every one of those paths, there are experiences and, and abilities. God gives us gifts to use for Him. And God has condescended to use us. And, and if we say that God can't possibly use me, that's absolutely wrong. God says, I enjoy using you. I want to use you for my honor and glory. And we talked mostly today about those who were saved. If you have Christ your Savior, there's a job for you to do. There's a job for us all to do. But what about if you're not saved? If you're sitting here this morning and you don't have Christ as your Savior, remember, the reconciliation, the finished work of Christ at Calvary was for you too. Was for you too. He paid the price for your sin and God is patiently waiting for you. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, But God is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to be saved. And he's patiently waiting for you to do that. And when you realize your need for a Savior, and that he paid the price for you, you accept him as your Savior, God will save you immediately. God will, God will, will uh, immediately bring you into the family. You can start your own race and begin your own ministry. I'll end with, with Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and that he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You reach out and accept Christ as your Savior, God will abundantly pardon you and He will save you. And you can join in the fight with the rest of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time that You've given us. Lord, we're so thankful that You've condescended to use people like us to see souls get saved. Father, to do the work that You've set before us. Lord, You could use whoever You wanted, but You've condescended to use us as you told the Corinthians, to give them encouragement. Because, Lord, you, you, you said right there that part of their, um, their number, there weren't too many that were wise, there weren't too many that were strong, there weren't too many that were noble, but it pleased you to use them. Father, that should be encouraging to all of us. We thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that you'll help each one of us to find out what you want us to do, how we can best be your ambassadors to reconcile those to Christ. Lord, we 